we interrupt the scheduled programming for the 2000 subscriber special for stories of futures past. Presenting five stories selected among your humble narrator's personal favourites. I really hope you'll enjoy these stories as much as I do. Thank you to all subscribers. This channel would not have been possible without you. And if you're not subscribed, you should be. More stories are presented every day. Enough talk. Now for the stories. Beyond Lies the Wub by Philip K. Dick Ask a Foolish Question by Robert Sheckley Underground Movement by Alan Kim Lang Hunt the Hunter by Chris Neville The God on the 36th Floor by Herbert D. Castle Beyond Lies the Wub by Philip K. Dick Originally published in Planet Stories, July 1952 Narrated by Tom Trussell They had almost finished with the loading. Outside stood the Optus, his arms folded, his face sunk in gloom. Captain Franco walked leisurely down the gangplank, grinning. "'What's the matter?' he said. "'You're getting paid for all this.' The Optus said nothing. He turned away, collecting his robes. The captain put his boot on the hem of the robe. "'Just a minute. Don't go off. I'm not finished.' "'Oh?' the Optus turned with dignity. "'I am going back to the village.' He looked toward the animals and birds and being driven up the gangplank into the spaceship. I must organise new hunts. Franco lit a cigarette. Why not? You people can go out into the veldt and track it all down again. But when we run out halfway between Mars and Earth... The Optus went off wordless. Franco joined the first mate at the bottom of the gangplank. How's it coming? he said. He looked at his watch. We got a good bargain here. The mate glanced at him sourly. How do you explain that? What's the matter with you? We need it more than they do. I'll see you later, Captain. The mate threaded his way up the plank between the long-legged Martian go-birds into the ship. Franco watched him disappear. He was just starting up after him, up the plank toward the port, when he saw it. My God! He stood staring, his hands on his hips. Peterson was walking along the path, his face red, leading it by a string. "'I'm sorry, Captain,' he said, tugging at the string. Franco walked toward him. "'What is it?' The wub stood sagging, its great body settling slowly. It was sitting down, its eyes half shut. A few flies buzzed about its flank and it switched its tail. It sat. There was silence. It's a wub, Peterson said. I got it from a native for fifty cents. He said it was a very unusual animal, very respected. This, Franco poked the great sloping side of the wub, it's a pig, a huge dirty pig. Yes, sir, it's a pig. The natives call it a wub. A huge pig! It must weigh four hundred pounds. Franco grabbed a tuft of the rough hair. The wub gasped, its eyes opened, small and moist. Then its great mouth twitched. A tear rolled down the wub's cheek and splashed on the floor. Maybe it's good to eat, Peterson said nervously. We'll soon find out, Franco said. The wub survived the takeoff, sound asleep in the hold of the ship. When they were out in space and everything was running smoothly, Captain Franco bade his men fetch the wub upstairs so that he might perceive what manner of beast it was. The wub grunted and wheezed, squeezing up the passageway. Come on, Jones grated, pulling at the rope. The wub twisted, rubbing its skin off on the smooth chrome walls. It burst into the anteroom, tumbling down in a heap. 
The men leapt up. Good Lord, French said. What is it? Peterson says it's a wub, Jones said. It belongs to him. He kicked at the wub. The wub stood up unsteadily, panting. What's the matter with it? French came over. Is it going to be sick? They watched. The wub rolled its eyes mournfully. It gazed around at the men. I think it's thirsty, Peterson said. He went to get some water. French shook his head. No wonder we had so much trouble taking off. I had to reset all my ballast calculations. Peterson came back with the water. The wub began to lap gratefully, splashing the men. Captain Franco appeared at the door. Let's have a look at it. He advanced, squinting critically. You got this for fifty cents. Yes, sir, Peterson said. It eats almost anything. I fed it on grain and it liked that. And then potatoes and mash and scraps from the table and milk. It seems to enjoy eating. After it eats, it lies down and goes to sleep. I see, Captain Franco said. Now, as to its taste, that's the real question. I doubt if there's much point in fattening it up any more. It seems fat enough to me already. Where's the cook? I want him here. I want to find out. The wub stopped lapping and looked up at the captain. Really, captain, the wub said, I suggest we talk of other matters. The room was silent. What was that? Franco said, just now. The wub, sir, Peterson said, it spoke. They all looked at the wub. What did it say? What did it say? It suggested we talk about other things. Franco walked toward the wub. He went all around it, examining it from every side. Then he came back over and stood with the men. I wonder if there's a native inside it, he said thoughtfully. Maybe we should open it up and have a look. Oh, goodness, the wub cried. Is that all you people can think of, killing and cutting? Franco clenched his fist. Come out of there, whoever you are, come out. Nothing stirred. The men stood together, their faces blank, staring at the wub. The wub swished its tail. It belched suddenly. I beg your pardon, the wub said. I don't think there's anyone in there, Jones said in a low voice. They all looked at each other. The cook came in. You wanted me, Captain, he said. What's this thing? This is a wub, Franco said. It's to be eaten. Will you measure it and figure out? I think we should have a talk, the wub said. I'd like to discuss this with you, Captain, if I might. I can see that you and I do not agree on some basic issues. The Captain took a long time to answer. The wub waited good-naturedly, licking the water from its jowls. Come into my office, the Captain said at last. He turned and walked out of the room. The wub rose and padded after him. The men watched it go out. They heard it climbing the stairs. I wonder what the outcome will be, the cook said. Well, I'll be in the kitchen. Let me know as soon as you're here. Sure, Jones said, sure. The wub eased itself down in the corner with a sigh. You must forgive me, it said. I'm afraid I'm addicted to various forms of relaxation when one is as large as I. The captain nodded impatiently. He sat down at his desk and folded his hands. All right, he said. Let's get started. You're a wub, is that correct? The wub shrugged. I suppose so. That's what they call us, the natives, I mean. We have our own term. And you speak English? You've been in contact with Earthmen before? No. Then how do you do it? Speak English? Am I speaking English? I'm not conscious of speaking anything in particular. I examined your mind. My mind? I studied the contents, especially the semantic warehouse, as I refer to it. I see, the captain said. Telepathy, of course. We are a very old race, the wub said. Very old and very ponderous. It is difficult for us to move around. 
You can appreciate that anything so slow and heavy would be at the mercy of more agile forms of life. There was no use in our relying on physical defences. How could we win? Too heavy to run, too soft to fight, too good natures to hunt for game. How do you live? Plants, vegetables, we can eat almost anything. We're very Catholic, tolerant, eclectic, Catholic. We live and let live. That's how we've gotten along. The wub eyed the captain. And that's why I so violently objected to this business about having me boiled. I could see the image in your mind, most of me in the frozen food locker, some of me in the kettle, a bit for your pet cat. So you read minds, the captain said. How interesting. Anything else? I mean, what else can you do along those lines? A few odds and ends, the wub said absently, staring around the room. A nice apartment you have here, Captain. You keep it quite neat. I respect life forms that are tidy. Some Martian birds are quite tidy. They throw things out of their nests and sweep them. Indeed, the Captain nodded. But to get back to the problem, ah, quite so. You spoke of dining on me. The taste, I am told, is good. A little fatty, but tender. And how can any lasting contact be established between your people and mine if you resort to such barbaric attitudes? Eat me? Rather you should discuss questions with me. Philosophy. The arts. The captain stood up. Philosophy. It might interest you to know that we will be hard put to find something to eat for the next month. An unfortunate spoilage. I know, the wub nodded. But wouldn't it be more in accord with your principles of democracy if we all drew straws, or something along that line? After all, democracy is to protect the minority from just such infringements. Now, if each of us cast one vote... The captain walked to the door. Nuts to you, he said. He opened the door, he opened his mouth. He stood frozen, his mouth wide, his eyes staring, his fingers still on the knob. The wub watched him. Presently it padded out of the room, edging past the captain. It went down the hall, deep in meditation. The room was quiet. So you see, the wub said, we have a common myth. Your mind contains many familiar myth symbols, Ishtar, Odysseus. Peterson sat silently staring at the floor. He shifted in his chair. Go on, he said, please go on. I find in your Odysseus a figure common to the mythology of most self-conscious races. As I interpret it, Odysseus wonders as an individual, aware of himself as such. This is the idea of separation, of separation from family and country, the process of individuation. But Odysseus returns to his home. Peterson looked out the port window, at the stars, endless stars, burning intently in the empty universe. Finally he goes home. As must all creatures, the moment of separation is a temporary period, a brief journey of the soul. It begins, it ends, the wanderer returns to land and race. The door opened, the wub stopped, turning its great head. Captain Franco came into the room, the men behind him. They hesitated at the door. Are you all right? French said. Do you mean me? Peterson said, surprised. Why me? Franco lowered his gun. Come over here, he said to Peterson. Get up and come here. There was silence. Go ahead, the wub said. It doesn't matter. Peterson stood up. What for? It's an order. Peterson walked to the door. French caught his arm. What's going on? Peterson wrenched loose. What's the matter with you? Captain Franco moved toward the wub. The wub looked up from where it lay in the corner, pressed against the wall. It is interesting, the wub said, that you are obsessed with the idea of eating me. I wonder why. Get up, Franco said. If you wish, the wub rose, grunting. Be patient. It is difficult for me. It stood, gasping its tongue lolling foolishly. "'Shoot it now,' French said. "'For God's sake!' Peterson exclaimed. 
Jones turned to him quickly, his eyes grey with fear. You didn't see him, like a statue, standing there, his mouth open. If we hadn't come down, he'd still be there. Who? The captain? Peterson stared around. But he's all right now. They looked at the wub, standing in the middle of the room, its great chest rising and falling. Come on, Franco said, out of the way. The men pulled aside toward the door. You are quite afraid, aren't you? the wub said. Have I done anything to you? I am against the idea of hurting. All I have done is try to protect myself. Can you expect me to rush eagerly to my death? I am a sensible being, like yourselves. I was curious to see your ship, learn about you. I suggested to the native. The gun jerked. See, si, Franco said, I thought so. The wub settled down, panting. It put its paw out, pulling its tail around it. It is very warm, the wub said. I understand that we are close to the jets. Atomic power. You have done many wonderful things with it, technically. Apparently your scientific hierarchy is not equipped to solve moral, ethical. Franco turned to the men crowding behind him, wide-eyed, silent. I'll do it. You can watch. French nodded. Try to hit the brain. It's no good for eating. Don't hit the chest if the ribcage shatters. We'll have to pick bones out. Listen, Peterson said, licking his lips. Has it done anything? What harm has it done? I'm asking you. And anyhow, it's still mine. You've no right to shoot it. It doesn't belong to you. Franco raised his gun. I'm going out, Jones said, his face white and sick. I don't want to see it. Me too, French said. The men straggled out, murmuring. Peterson lingered at the door. It was talking to me about myths, he said. It wouldn't hurt anyone. He went outside. Franco walked toward the wub. The wub looked up slowly. It swallowed. A very foolish thing, it said. I am sorry that you want to do it. There was a parable that your saviour related. It stopped, staring at the gun. Can you look me in the eye and do it? The wub said. Can you do that? The captain gazed down. I can look you in the eye, he said. Back on the farm we had hogs. Dirty razorback hogs. I can do it. Staring down at the wub into the gleaming moist eyes, he pressed the trigger. The taste was excellent. They sat glumly around the table, some of them hardly eating at all. The only one who seemed to be enjoying himself was Captain Franco. More, he said, looking around. More? And some wine, perhaps? Not me, French said. I think I'll go back to the chart room. Me too, Jones stood up, pushing his chair back. I'll see you later. The captain watched them go. Some of the other excused themselves. What do you suppose the matter is? the captain said. He turned to Peterson. Peterson sat staring down at his plate, at the potatoes, the green peas, and at the thick slab of tender, warm meat. He opened his mouth. No sound came. The captain put his hand on Peterson's shoulder. It is only organic matter now, he said. The life essence is gone. He ate, spooning up the gravy with some bread. I, myself, love to eat. It is one of the greatest things that a living creature can enjoy. Eating, resting, meditation, discussing things. Peterson nodded. Two more men got up and went out. The captain drank some water and sighed. Well, he said, I must say that this was a very enjoyable meal. All the reports I have heard were quite true. The taste of wub, very fine but I was prevented from enjoying this pleasure in times past. He dabbed at his lips with his napkin and leaned back in his chair. Peterson stared dejectedly at the table. The captain watched him intently. He leaned over. Come, come, he said. Cheer up. Let's discuss things. He smiled. As I was saying before I was interrupted, the role of Odysseus in the myths. Peterson jerked up, staring. To go on, the captain said, 
Odysseus, as I understand him. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. Ask a Foolish Question by Robert Sheckley Originally published in Science Fiction Stories, 1953 Narrated by Tom Trussell It's well established now that the way you put a question often determines not only the answer you'll get, but the type of answer possible. So, a mechanical answerer, geared to produce the ultimate revelations in reference to anything you want to know, might have unsuspected limitations. Answerer was built to last as long as was necessary, which was quite long, as some races judge time, and not long at all, according to others. But to Answerer it was just long enough. As to size, Answerer was large to some and small to others. He could be viewed as complex, although some believed that he was really very simple. Answerer knew that he was as he should be. Above and beyond all else, he was the answerer. He knew. Of the race that built him, the less said the better. They also knew, and never said whether they found the knowledge pleasant. They built Answerer as a service to less sophisticated races, and departed in a unique manner. Where they went, only Answerer knows, because Answerer knows everything. Upon his planet, circling his sun, Answerer sat. Duration continued, long as some judge duration, short as others judge it but as it should be to Answerer. Within him were the answers. He knew the nature of things, and why things are as they are, and what they are, and what it all means. Answerer could answer anything, provided it was a legitimate question. And he wanted to. He was eager to. How else should an Answerer be? What else should an Answerer do? So he waited for creatures to come and ask. "'How do you feel, sir?' Moran asked, floating gently over to the old man. "'Better,' Lingman said, trying to smile. No wait was a vast relief. Even though Moran had expended an enormous amount of fuel getting into space and a minimum acceleration, Lingman's feeble heart hadn't liked it. Lingman's heart had balked and sulked, pounded angrily against the brittle ribcage, hesitated and sped up. It seemed for a time as though Lingman's heart was going to stop out of sheer peak. But no weight was a vast relief, and the feeble heart was going again. Moran had no such problems. His strong body was built for strain and stress. He wouldn't experience them on this trip, not if he expected old Lingman to live. "'I'm going to live!' Lingman muttered in answer to the unspoken question. Long enough to find out. Moran touched the controls, and the ship slipped into subspace like an eel into oil. We'll find out, Moran murmured. He helped the old man unstrap himself. We're going to find the answerer. Lingman nodded at his young partner. They had been reassuring themselves for years. Originally, it had been Lingman's project. Then Moran, graduating from Caltech, had joined him. Together they had traced the rumours across the solar system, the legends of an ancient humanoid race who had known the answer to all things, and who had built Answerer, and departed. Think of it, Moran said, the answer to everything. A physicist, Moran had many questions to ask Answerer. The expanding universe, the binding force of atomic nuclei, Novae and supernovae, planetary formation, redshift, relativity, and a thousand others. Yes, Lingman said. 
he pulled himself to the vision plate and looked out on the bleak prairie of the illusory subspace. He was a biologist and an old man. He had two questions. What is life? What is death? After a particularly long period of hunting purple, Lek and his friends gathered to talk. Purple always ran thin in the neighborhood of multiple cluster stars. Why, no one knew, so talk was definitely in order. Do you know, Lek said, I think I'll hunt up this answerer. Lek spoke the Olgrat language now, the language of imminent decision. Why? Ilm asked him in the Fwest tongue of light banter. Why do you want to know things? Isn't the job of gathering purple enough for you? No, Lek said, still speaking the language of imminent decision. It is not. The great job of Lek and his kind was the gathering of purple. They found purple embedded in many parts of the fabric of space, minute quantities of it. Slowly they were building a huge mound of it, what the mound was for, no one knew. I suppose you'll ask him what purple is, Ilm asked, pushing a star out of his way and lying down. I will, Lek said. We have continued in ignorance too long. We must know the true nature of purple and its meaning in the scheme of things. We must know why it governs our lives. For this speech, Lek switched to Ilgret, the language of incipient knowledge. Ilm and the others didn't try to argue, even in the tongue of arguments. They knew that the knowledge was important. Ever since the dawn of time, Lek, Ilm and the others had gathered purple. Now it was time to know the ultimate answers to the universe, what purple was and what the mound was for. And, of course, there was the answerer to tell them. Everyone had heard of the answerer, built by a race not unlike themselves, now long departed. "'Will you ask him anything else?' Ilm asked Lek. "'I don't know,' Lek said. "'Perhaps I'll ask about the stars. "'There's really nothing else important.' Since Lek and his brothers had lived since the dawn of time, they didn't consider death, and since their numbers were always the same, they didn't consider the question of life. But purple, and the mound... I go, Lex shouted, in the vernacular of decision to fact. Good fortune, his brothers shouted back, in the jargon of greatest friendship. Lex strode off, leaping from star to star. Alone on his little planet, Answerer sat, waiting for the questioners. Occasionally he mumbled the answers to himself. This was his privilege. He knew. But he waited, and the time was neither too long nor too short for any of the creatures of space to come and ask. There were eighteen of them gathered in one place. I invoke the rule of eighteen, cried one, and another appeared who had never before been born by the rule of eighteen. We must go to the answerer, one cried. Our lives are governed by the rule of eighteen. Where there are eighteen, there will be nineteen. Why is this so? No one could answer. Where am I? asked the newborn nineteenth. One took him aside for instruction. That left seventeen, a stable number. And we must find out, cried another. Why all places are different, although there is no distance? That was the problem. One is here, then one is there. Just like that, no movement, no reason. And yet, without moving, one is in another place. The stars are cold, one cried. Why? We must go to the answerer. For they had heard the legends knew the tales. Once there was a race, a good deal like us, and they knew, and they told Answerer. Then they departed to where there is no place, but much distance. How do we get there? 
The newborn nineteenth cried, filled now with knowledge, We go! And eighteen of them vanished. One was left. Moodily he stared at the tremendous spread of an icy star, and he too vanished. Those old legends are true, Moran gasped. There it is! They had come out of subspace at the place the legends told of, and before them was a star unlike any other star. Moran invented a classification for it, but it didn't matter. There was no other like it. Swinging around the star was a planet, and this too was unlike any other planet. Moran invented reasons, but they didn't matter. This planet was the only one. Strap yourself in, sir, Moran said. I'll land as gently as I can. Lek came to Answerer, striding swiftly from star to star. He lifted Answerer in his hand and looked at him. So you are Answerer, he said. Yes, Answerer said. Then tell me, Lek said, settling himself comfortably in a gap between the stars. Tell me what I am. A partiality, Answerer said, an indication. Come now, Lek muttered, his pride hurt. You can do better than that. Now then, the purpose of my kind is to gather purple and to build a mound of it. Can you tell me the real meaning of this? Your question is without meaning, Answerer said. He knew what purple actually was and what the mound was for but the explanation was concealed in a greater explanation. Without this, Lek's question was inexplicable, and Lek had failed to ask the real question. Lek asked other questions, and Answerer was unable to answer them. Lek viewed things through his specialised eyes, extracted a part of the truth, and refused to see more. How to tell a blind man the sensation of green? Answerer didn't try. He wasn't supposed to. Finally, Lek emitted a scornful laugh. One of his little stepping stones flared at the sound, then faded back to its usual intensity. Lek departed, striding swiftly across the stars. Answerer knew but he had to be asked the proper questions first. He pondered this limitation, gazing at the stars which were neither large nor small, but exactly the right size. The proper questions. The race which built Answerer should have taken that into account, Answerer thought. They should have made some allowance for semantic nonsense, allowed him to attempt the unravelling. Answerer contented himself with muttering the answers to himself. Eighteen creatures came to Answerer, neither walking nor flying, but simply appearing. Shivering in the cold glare of the stars, they gazed up at the massiveness of Answerer. If there is no distance, one asked, then how can things be in other places? Answerer knew what distance was and what places were, but he couldn't answer the question. There was distance, but not as these creatures saw it. And there were places, but in a different fashion from that which the creatures expected. Rephrase the question, Answerer said hopefully. Why are we short here? one asked, and long over there. Why are we fat over there? and short here. Why are the stars cold? Answerer knew all things. He knew why stars were cold, but he couldn't explain it in terms of stars or coldness. Why, another asked, is there a rule of eighteen? Why, when eighteen gather, is another produced? But of course the answer was part of another, greater question which hadn't been asked. Another was produced by the rule of eighteen, and the nineteen creatures vanished. Answerer mumbled the right questions to itself, and answered them. 
We made it, Moran said. Well, well. He patted Lingman on the shoulder, lightly, because Lingman might fall apart. The old biologist was tired. His face was sunken, yellow, lined. Already the mark of the skull was showing in his prominent yellow teeth, his small flat nose, his exposed cheekbones. The matrix was showing through. Let's get on, Lingman said. He didn't want to waste any time. He didn't have any time to waste. Helmeted, they walked along the little path. Not so fast, Lingman murmured. Right, Moran said. They walked together along the dark path of the planet that was different from all other planets, soaring alone around a sun different from all other suns. Up here, Moran said. The legends were explicit. A path leading to stone steps, stone steps to a courtyard, and then the answerer. To them, answerer looked like a white screen set in a wall. To their eyes, answerer was very simple. Lingman clasped his shaking hands together. This was the culmination of a lifetime's work, financing, arguing, ferreting bits of legend, ending here, now. Remember, he said to Moran, we will be shocked. The truth will be like nothing we have imagined. I'm ready, Moran said, his eyes rapturous. Very well, answerer, Lingman said in his thin little voice. What is life? The voice spoke in their heads. The question has no meaning. By life, the questioner is referring to a partial phenomenon, inexplicable except in terms of its whole. Of what is life a part? Lingman asked. This question, in its present form, admits of no answer. Questioner is still considering life from his personal limited bias. Answer it in your own terms, then, Moran said. The answerer can only answer questions, answerer thought again of the sad limitation imposed by its builder. Silence. Is the universe expanding? Moran asked confidently. Expansion is a term inapplicable to the situation. Universe, as the questioner views it, is an illusory concept. Can you tell us anything? Moran asked. I can answer any valid question concerning the nature of things. The two men looked at each other. I think I know what he means, Lingman said sadly. Our basic assumptions are wrong. All of them. They can't be, Moran said. Physics. Biology. Partial truths, Lingman said, with a great weariness in his voice. At least we've determined that much. We've found out that our inferences concerning observed phenomena are wrong. But the rule of the simplest hypothesis is only a theory, Lingman said. But life! He certainly could answer what life is. Look at it this way, Lingman said. Suppose you were to ask, why was I born under the constellation Scorpio in conjunction with Saturn? I would be unable to answer your questions in terms of the Zodiac, because the Zodiac has nothing to do with it. I see, Moran said slowly. He can't answer questions in terms of our assumptions. That seems to be the case, and he can't alter our assumptions. He is limited to valid questions, which imply, it would seem, a knowledge we just don't have. We can't even ask a valid question? Moran asked. I don't believe that. We must know some basics. He turned to Answerer. What is death? I cannot explain an anthropomorphism. Death? An anthropomorphism? Moran said, and Lingman turned quickly. 
Now we're getting somewhere. Are anthropomorphisms unreal? he asked. Anthropomorphisms may be classified tentatively as A. False truths or B. Partial truths in terms of a partial situation. Which is applicable here? Both. That was the closest they got. Moran was unable to draw any more from Answerer. For hours the two men tried, but truth was slipping farther and farther away. It's maddening, Moran said after a while. This thing has the answer to the whole universe, and it can't tell us unless we ask the right question. But how are we supposed to know the right question? Lingman sat down on the ground, leaning against a stone wall. He closed his eyes. Savages, that's what we are, Moran said, pacing up and down in front of Answerer. Imagine a bushman walking up to a physicist and asking why he can't shoot his arrow into the sun. The scientist can explain it only in his own terms. What would happen? The scientist wouldn't even attempt it, Lingman said in a dim voice. He would know the limitations of the questioner. It's fine, Moran said angrily. How do you explain the Earth's rotation to a bushman? Or better, how do you explain relativity to him? Maintaining scientific rigour in your explanation at all times, of course. Lingman, eyes closed, didn't answer. We're Bushmen, but the gap is much greater here. Worm and Superman, perhaps. The worm desires to know the nature of dirt. And why is there so much of it? Oh, well. Shall we go, sir? Moran asked. Lingman's eyes remained closed. His taloned fingers were clenched. His cheeks sunk further in. The skull was emerging. Sir! Sir! An answerer knew that that was not the answer. Alone on his planet, which is neither large nor small, but exactly the right size, answerer waits. He cannot help the people who come to him, for even answerer has restrictions. He can answer only valid questions. Universe, life, death, purple, eighteen, partial truths, hearth truths, little bits of the great question. But answerer alone mumbles the questions to himself, the true questions which no one can understand. How could they understand the true answers? The questions will never be asked. An answerer remembers something his builders knew and forgot. In order to ask a question, you must already know most of the answer. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. Underground Movement by Alan Kim Lang Originally published in Infinity, December 1956 Narrated by Tom Trissel The hatch to the front compartment swung open for the first time. One man came out. He turned at once to make sure that the airtight door behind him had locked. Satisfied that it had, he turned again to look down the cabin at us. His face showed that insolence we'd learned to know as the uniform of the Bupo, the state secret police. The man from Bupo walked down the aisle between the passengers toward the rear of the car. He swept his eyes right and left like a suspecting machine, catching every detail of us on his memory. People leaned toward the walls as he approached, like children shrinking back from a big animal, and relaxed as he went by. He was out of sight in the galley at the area for a moment, then was back, carrying a pitcher of water in one hand and the key to the front compartment in the other. A battering ram hammered into my belly. I slammed, bent, hitting my head against the knees of the man sitting across from me. 
the capsule shuddered, smearing some obstruction against its outer wall. There was an instant when I weighed nothing. Then my head snapped back with hangman's violence as the capsule bounced forward a few meters. Then we were still. From the shock to the silence was a matter of ten seconds. I pulled myself up from the floor. Surprisingly, my skeleton still hinged at the joints and nowhere else. The bupo man was flat in the aisle, bleeding black splotches into the green carpet. He still had hold of a piece of the water pitcher's handle. I ignored him while my brain began to push out explanations for this impossible accident. Something had gotten into the tube, that slick intestine we'd ridden through under the Andes, below the Mato Grosso, and out under the Pampas. Something had got in the way of the hundred hurricanes that pushed us. The eyes and ears and unmanlike senses I'd helped build into this five thousand kilometres of metal gut had stopped the pumps. The vacuum inviting our capsule on had filled with air no longer tugging us to the terminal nest by the Atlantic. We were abandoned fifteen metres under God knows where. Mrs. Swaymer, who knew that I had helped in the tube's engineering, turned to me for explanation. "'What happened?' she asked. "'What did we hit?' The foreigner crossed the aisle. Mr. Edinklaven smiled, a curious effect. "'A cow on the track, I believe,' he said, his voice brassy with the accent of Mars. "'How did a cow get in here?' Anna demanded. She was the girl whose girlness had snagged the eyes and riled the hormones of every male in the car. "'The gentleman is joking,' I assured Anna. I glanced towards Surgeon General Reismazan, the man whose knees had hammered my forehead. He was clutching his right forearm, his eyes squeezed shut by pain. "'What happened, doctor?' I demanded, laying my hand on his shoulder. "'Fractured my arm, my ulna. Get my case under the seat. I want to look at him.' The doctor nodded towards the bupo man, who was struggling to sit up. I got out the doctor's bag. "'Morphine?' I asked, finding it. "'Codeine. Next tray. Will be plenty.' I dropped three of the pills into Dr. Rymazan's left hand. He swallowed them without water. I used my newspaper for a splint, rolling it tight and bandaging it to the doctor's forearm. Then I hammocked the arm in a sling made of a triangular bandage. "'Okay?' I asked. "'You could make a fortune in orthopaedics,' Dr. Rymazan said. Let's get our friend out of the aisle. I stepped out and pulled the policeman toward a sitting position. He groaned and opened his eyes. Though he'd fallen into the fragments of the broken picture, he'd suffered damage only to his dignity and his lower lip. A line of red dashes below the lip showed where his teeth had bitten through. He shook his head at our offers of tape and antiseptic and struggled to his feet. Holding the key to the front compartment before him like a dagger, he shuffled up there. He unlocked the door. Shouting something violent, he ducked into the compartment and slammed the door behind him. I lent my hands to the Surgeon General's instructions, patching up the cuts and sprains the passengers had gotten. In a moment, Miss Barry, the stewardess, took the bandages out of my hands and finished the job with fewer knots and less adhesive. The passengers sat quiet in the dim light of the capsule, as though afraid that panic might constitute a security violation. The lovely Anna pouted. Though she was unhurt herself, her precious radio was shattered. It lay under her seat, its antenna snapped like a slender idiot's neck, its electronic guts spilling from its belly. "'Whatever else happens, we're rid of that puling nuisance,' Don Ruff growled looking at the X radio. His mouth settled into creases, a satisfied line between parentheses. He picked up his magazine and leafed through it to prove himself superior to these chance joltings about. The lights maliciously dropped till only the bulbs at either end of the aisle were glowing. These died till they were yellow coils, magnifying the dark that was fogged us. In the top tray of my test kit was a flashlight, I broke it out to sweep the light in a quick survey of the car. Anna's eyes squinted at my beam, her mouth loose with fear for a moment, 
like a drawstring bag. Then she squared off, sat straight, and stared defiantly into my light. Without looking down, she snapped her purse open and took a tiny automatic pistol from it. She laid this on the seat beside her, out of sight. I've got a right to defend myself, Anna said, grim as a suffragette. I laughed out loud at this tableau of maidenhood at bay. She smoothed her hair back with both hands, making a double cantilever of her arms to lift her breasts, demonstrating the noble architecture of woman, mocking me. I stopped laughing. I jumped the beam over her to help Miss Barry break out the emergency lights. Those lamps were lit and glowed in the cabin with a chilly blue light. Mrs. Swaymer asked of the woman beside her, as though it was an afterthought, Why did we stop? I don't know, Mrs. Grimm admitted. I knew her. She was the wife of the Minister of Agriculture, a man who'd acquired a reputation for integrity in a government that didn't use the word. For me, the tube has always been just a link between home and Albert's office at Bayer. I didn't think that link could break. Miss Barry was knocking at the door up front. It opened a reluctant inch to show the eyes of the Bupo cop. He growled some answer to the stewardess's question, then slammed and relocked his door. Miss Barry hurried back to me. A man was pulled out of that compartment, she said. He unlocked the entry hatch and was blown out into the tube by cabin pressure. Like a beetle blasted off a bush by a garden hose, Don Raffi murmured. I expect my baggage is strung out from here to Havana, Anna pouted. Doesn't the state have regulations to keep prisoners from killing themselves on public property? Suicide? Mrs. Swaymer asked soft as a prayer. Must have been, Don Raff snapped. He twisted his magazine into a club, underlining his words with thumps against his open palm. Some weakling not worthy to stand with us in war, he was. A conscientious objector, probably. Don Raff said, conscientious objector, exactly as if he had said the name of a sexual perversion. We're all going to the capital on the leader's business. Some of us have been called to the leader's actual presence. He glowed pride, giving his secret away. There is no place in the leader's new society for weaklings. They are better where this one is, underground, dead. Many of us are pained by the thought of war, the Martian said. Not in the pain of weakness, but that of pity for men lost in battle who might have grown strong in peace. A peacemonger, Don Ruffs, was the tone of a Puritan finding a red zucchetto under his pastor's hat. Surely you don't expect our leader to bear forever the insults of the Yellow Confederacy? Of course. Don Raff's eyes widened in anticipation of delicious violence. You men from Mars are yellow, too. The foreigner, whose skin was in fact the colour of lemon peel, smiled and made no comment. I wish you men wouldn't talk so much about war, Mrs. Swayme broke in. Talking about ugly things just helps them to happen. Raphael, my boy, is in the Continental Guard. He says we'll have no war. He says that the Confederacy is too afraid of our air power to risk a war. Raphael is a flyer. Of course, Don Raff smiled, his smile not reaching up to his eyes. The Yellow Confederacy is so afraid of our flying defenders that we're forced to travel like moles so as not to confuse our own radar guns. Our skies are closed to us. Everything that flies across the two continents, from Tierra del Fuego to Medicine Hat, is shot from the air as an enemy. We must take to these caves for a ten-hour trip. Ten hours for a capsule to be blown from Bogota to the coast, a trip a rocket could clip off in minutes. That's why our leader will take us to war, to get back the freedom of our own blue skies. Don Raff finished, a little breathless. I wonder who the poor man was, Mrs. Swaymer said, ignoring him. Miss Barry shook her head, wondering the same thing. Without saying anything, she went back to the galley to call a surface station on the capsule's radio telephone. While she was back there, Miss Barry took a lamp and peered through the glass window in the rear hatch. She saw what becomes of a man caught between a piston in capsule and its tube. After being sick, she came to tell us that the surface station had determined that we were just east of the village of Rabanan. 
My mental map of the route the tube followed showed Rabanan as a dot fifteen kilometres from the nearest exit hatch. Miss Barry smiled on courage. A rescue party will be here before long, she assured the others. Would anyone care for sandwiches or coffee while we wait? Her stomach must have cringed at the thought. Tea would be nice, Mr. Rinclaven volunteered. Then he realised his blunder. Tea came from Confederacy countries. I mean coffee, of course, he said. I'll help you get it ready, Mrs. Grimm said to Miss Barry. Oh, no, the hostess protested, without much conviction in her voice. Mrs. Grimm smiled and led the way back to the galley. In a moment she had the water for her coffee steaming on the chemical burner. The stewardess, meanwhile, was smearing the current butter substitute on slivers of bread and arranging the buttered triangles into Maltese crosses on our plates. Thus Miss Barry brought us tiffin. The Martian took his coffee black. He sat looking into it as he sipped, as though apologising for his alien presence. Mrs. Swamer, more practised than the rest of us in this act of informal reflection, took a slice of bread and a cup of sugar-thick coffee and talked. She steered clear of the grim topics around us, turning her attention instead to Mr. Rinclaven, who sparkled black at her like a grateful mirror. "'Is this your first visit to Earth?' she asked him. "'No, indeed. I spent several years at your excellent university at Sao Paulo,' the yellow man said. "'That was some time ago, of course.' He refrained from saying just how long ago. The Martian lifespan makes humanity's scant three score and ten look feeble. The Surgeon General asked me quietly, "'Why, exactly, are we held here?' As long as the body is back there, the pumps can't run. Safety devices prevent the capsule from moving so long as there's a foreign body in the tube. I stopped, suddenly aware of my clumsy, accidental pun. All right, Dr. Rymerson said. We'll have to move the corpse into the capsule and take it to Bayer with us. It will be the worst sort of job, I said. If the repair crew takes more than a day, we're in for trouble anyway. He was right. This was February, our hottest month. You have a strong stomach? he asked. No. I hurried forward to tell Miss Barry of our decision. She gave us a lamp and a blanket, and phoned the surface to tell them what we were doing. The doctor and I locked the airtight door of the galley behind us. At this end of the capsule there was a second airtight hatch, exactly like that in front, the one the body had hurtled through. At its middle, like a glass navel, was a dial showing the pressure outside. It read 975 millibars. I spun the wheel to unlock the door from its frame, stubbornly resisting the temptation to anticipate through the window, to see what waited us out there. The hatch swung out. I turned the lamplight on the walls outside. It was bad. The tube was bulged at the top a little way back, like a vein about to rupture. Its surface was smeared with red. It smelled like a place where they slaughtered chickens. The body lay about twenty metres back. I took the blanket from Dr. Rymerson and walked back along the slippery shaft, trying to dull my eyes and nose to what I was about to do. The doctor, one arm trussed to his chest by my crude sling, could lend me only moral support. I looked down at the corpse. One arm had been torn off at the shoulder and was held to the body by the handcuffs between the wrists. The man had been cut and burned and broken before he'd thrown himself out the capsule. I rolled the thing into the blanket and dragged it behind me to the capsule. It took ten minutes for me to force it through the hatch. Inside we rolled the body under the galley sink then washed our shoes and ourselves. We dogged the hatch shut and phoned topside, telling them to let the winds take hold again. As we made ready to go back into the cabin, the light of my lamp glinted off a bit of metal lying on the floor. It had fallen from a horrible package under the sink. Dr. Rymerson picked it up. He held it near the lamp, examining it. He was going to say something to me when the door to the cabin which we'd unlocked, burst open. "'What in the hell's name are you doing?' 
the booper man demanded. We've cleared the tube, I said very softly, shoving before his face the card that showed with my face and fingerprints that I was a tube engineer. The Surgeon General stared at the policeman as though he was something wet and stinking from a swamp. "'Who was the man who jumped from your compartment?' the doctor asked. "'State business,' the bupo snapped. "'Keep your mouth shut.' Too late, he recognised the Surgeon General's uniform and became silent. "'Watch your long tongue,' Dr. Rymazan growled. "'I have an audience with a leader.' You may find yourself envying the poor devil under the sink his blanket. The bupo, wavering between anger and apology, settled on an attitude of injured dignity. He turned and stalked down the aisle toward his private cabin up front. I followed him with my eyes, memorising him. In case I should ever meet him again, I wanted to complete wrecking his face where the accident had left off. The capsule jumped onto its plunger of wind. Only the brilliance of the ceiling lights showed that we were again flashing toward the coast and the capital. I sat beside the Surgeon General. "'What was it that you picked up back there?' I asked him. He handed me the thing. It was a medal of honour. Its ribbon was a scrap of silk, and the medal itself was bent as though it had been clamped in a vice and hammered turning it over. I read the engraved legend through a smear of blood. To Dr. Noah Rymazan, for devotion to his profession, his people, and his leader. A curt congratulation, I thought. After a moment I asked, A brother? My oldest son. He saved hundreds in the ruins of Managua, in the plague that followed the revolution there. Dr. Rymazan took the medal from me and sat rocking back and forth, staring at the laurel-garnished star in his hand. "'Why did they kill him?' he asked. "'It wasn't suicide. It was escape. You saw what they'd done to him, with their little knives, their pliers and electrodes. Noah was a hero, set by imperial order on a pedestal. He looked directly at the leader, man to man, his physician.' He wasn't as strong as I am, this son of mine. Noah couldn't watch men killed for their ideas, defending his silence with the argument that he was a doctor, set somewhere above grubby politics. Dr. Rymerson's voice was loud enough that anyone in the car who wished could have heard him. Your son died for talking plain, I whispered to the doctor. We sat in silence. The capital of the leader of a hemisphere, was only an hour away. After a moment, the Surgeon General sat straight. He brushed his uniform with his left hand and smoothed the sling under his right arm. Then he crossed the aisle to the seat where Anna sat. I stared at him. "'Do you mind if I sit beside you?' he smiled down at the girl, as gallant as though he were at a military ball. "'As you wish, General,' Anna answered. She was pleased, I saw, that a man with such a uniform and such position should notice her. The doctor talked to Anna the way a pretty girl expects to be talked to, emphasising what was saying by an occasional avuncular pat. After a while, Anna grew a little bored with a playmate who was older than her father. As the car began to slow, caught by resistance coils in the walls of the tube, I saw the Surgeon General pat the girl playfully one more and pick up something she had laid beside her in the darkness. She didn't notice. We halted on the shores of the Bay of All Saints, Baia, the capital. We saw no more of the Bupo man, since his compartment held the exit hatch. He was out first, scurrying somewhere with the news of Noah Rymazan's suicide, news which would either lift him a notch in his profession or push his head onto the chopping block. The rest of us lined up, passed through the front compartment, out onto the platform. The station sparkled like a diamond tiara, glittering with slogans and brass and reminders that we'd reached the greatest city on our half of the world. A grey sedan stood on the ramp, waiting for those the leader had singled out for audience. Its door bore those interlocked commas, the yin-yang symbol that the leader had taken from the enemy to make his cipher. Dr. Rymazan nodded goodbye to me. 
accompanied by Don Ruff, he walked over to the imperial limousine. The Surgeon General replied to the salutes of the bodyguards with his left hand, turning aside their references to his injury with a grin. The doors slammed shut, and the sedan roared off, carrying Don Ruff and the Surgeon General Rimazan to meet the leader, and carrying, under the doctor's sling, the little pistol I'd seen him steal from Anna. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. Hunt the Hunter by Chris Neville Originally published in Galaxy Science Fiction, June 1951 Narrated by Tom Trussell Of course, using live bait is the best way to lure dangerous alien animals, unless it turns out that you are the bait. We're somewhat to the south, I think, Rye said, bending over the crude field map. That ridge, he pointed, on our left, is right here. He drew a finger down the map. It was over here, he moved the finger, over the ridge, north of here, that we sighted them. Extroni asked, is there a pass? Re looked up, studying the terrain. He moved his shoulders. I don't know, but maybe they ranged this far. Maybe they're on this side of the ridge too. Delicately, Extroni raised a hand to his beard. I'd hate to lose a day crossing the ridge, he said. Yes, sir, Rye said. Suddenly he threw back his head. Listen! Eh? Extroni said. Hear it, that cough? I think that's one from over there, right up ahead of us. Extroni raised his eyebrows. This time the coughing roar was more distant but distinct. It is, Rye said. It's a fawn beast, all right. Extroni smiled, almost pointed teeth showing through the beard. I'm glad we won't have to cross the ridge. Ryan wiped his forehead on the back of his sleeve. Yes, sir. We'll pitch camp right here, then, Extroni said. We'll go after it tomorrow. He looked at the sky. Have the bearers hurry. Yes, sir. Ryan moved away, his pulse gradually slowing. You there, he called. Pitch camp, here. He crossed to Mia, who along with him had been pressed into Extroni's party as guides. Once more, Rai addressed the bearers. Be quick now. And to Mia. God almighty, he was getting mad. He ran a hand under his collar. It's a good thing that farm beast sounded off when it did. I hate to think of making him climb that ridge. Mia glanced nervously over his shoulder. It's that damned pilot's fault for setting us down on this side. I told him it was the other side. I told him so. Rye shrugged hopelessly. Mia said, I don't think he even saw a blast area over there. I think he wanted to get us in trouble. There shouldn't be one. There shouldn't be a blast area on this side of the ridge, too. That's what I mean. The pilot don't like businessmen. He had it in for us. Rye cleared his throat nervously. Maybe you're right. It's the hunting club you don't like. I wish to God I'd never heard of a farm beast, Rye said. At least then, I wouldn't be one of his guides. Why didn't he hire somebody else? Mia looked at his companion. He spat. What hurts most, he pays us for it. I could buy half this planet, and he makes me his guide, at less than I pay my secretary. Well, anyway, we won't have to cross that ridge, Hey, you! Extroni called. The two of them turned immediately. You two scout ahead, Extroni said. See if you can pick up some tracks. Yes, sir, Rice said, and instantly the two of them readjusted their shoulder straps and started off. Shortly they were inside of the scrub forest, safe from sight. Let's wait here, Mia said. No, we better go on. He may have sent a spy in. They pushed on been careful to blaze the trees because they were not professional guides. We don't want to get too near, Rye said after toiling through the forest for many minutes. Without guns, we don't want to get near enough for the farm bees to charge us. They stopped. The forest was dense, the vines clinging. 
He'll want the bearers to hack a path for him, Mia said. But we go it alone. Damn him! Rye twisted his mouth into a sour frown. He wiped at his forehead. Hot, by God, it's hot. I didn't think it was this hot the first time we were here. Mia said, The first time we weren't guides. We didn't notice it so much then. They fought a few yards more into the forest. Then it ended, or rather, there was a wide gap. Before them lay a blast area, unmistakable. The grass was beginning to grow again, but the tree stumps were roasted from the rocket breath. This isn't ours, Rye said. This looked like it was made nearly a year ago. Mia's eyes narrowed. The military from X now? No, Rye said. They don't have any rockets this small, and I don't think there's another cargo rocket on this planet outside of the one we leased from the club. Except the one he brought. The ones who discovered the farm beast in the first place? Mia asked. You think it's their blast? So, Rye said, but who are they? It was Mia's turn to shrug. Whoever they were, they couldn't have been hunters. They'd have kept the secret better. We didn't do so damn well. We didn't have a chance, Mia objected. Everybody and his brother had heard the rumour that farm beasts were somewhere around here. It wasn't our fault, Extroni found out. I wish we hadn't shot our guide then. I wish he was here instead of us. Mia shook perspiration out of his eyes. We should have shot our pilot too. That was our mistake. The pilot must have been the one who told Extroni we'd hunted this area. I didn't think a club pilot would do that. After Extroni said he'd hunt farm beasts, even if it meant going to the alien system. Listen, you don't know. Wait a minute. There was perspiration on Rye's upper lip. I didn't tell Extroni, if that was what you're thinking, Mia said. Rye's mouth twisted. I didn't say you did. Listen, Mia said in a hoarse whisper. I just thought. Listen. To hell with how we found out. Here's the point. Maybe he'll shoot us too when the hunt's over. Rye licked his lips. Nah, he wouldn't do that. We're not, not just anybody. He couldn't kill us like that. Not even him. And besides, why would he want to do that? It wouldn't do any good to shoot us. Too many people already know about the farm beasts. You said that yourself. Mia said, I hope you're right. They stood side by side, studying the blast area in silence. Finally, Mia said, We'd better be getting back. What'll we tell him? That we saw tracks. What else can we tell him? They turned back along their trail, stumbling over vines. It gets hotter at sunset, Rye said nervously. The breeze dies down. It's screwy. I didn't think farm beast had this wider range. There must be a lot of them to be on both sides of the ridge like this. There may be a pass, Mia said, pushing a vine away. Rye wrinkled his brow, panting. I guess that's it. If there were a lot of them, we'd have heard something before we did. But even so, it's damned funny when you think about it. Mia looked up at the darkening sky. We'd better hurry, he said. When it came over the hastily established camp, the rocket was low, obviously looking for a landing site. It was a military craft from the outpost on the near moon, and forward near the nose there was the blazoned emblem of the Ninth Fleet. The rocket roared directly over Extroni's tent, turned slowly, spouting fuel expensively, and settled into the scrub forest, turning the vegetation beneath its sear by its blast. Extroni sat on an upholstered stool before his tent and spat disgustedly and combed his beard with his blunt fingers. Shortly from the direction of the rocket, a group of four high-ranking officers came out of the forest heading toward him. There were Spruce, the officers, with military discipline holding their waist in and knees almost stiff. "'What in hell do you want?' Extroni asked. They stopped a respectful distance away. 
Sir, one began. Haven't I told you, gentlemen, that rockets frighten the game? Extroni demanded, ominously not raising his voice. Sir, the lead officer said, it's another alien ship. It was sighted a few hours ago off this very planet, sir. Extroni's face looked much too innocent. How did it get there, gentlemen? Why wasn't it destroyed? We lost it again, sir. Temporarily, sir. So? Extroni mocked. We thought you ought to return to a safer planet, sir, until we could locate and destroy it. Extroni stared at them for a space. Then, indifferently, he turned away in the direction of a resting bearer. You, he said. Hey, bring me a drink. He faced the officers again. He smiled maliciously. I'm staying here. The lead officer licked his firm lower lip. But, sir... Extroni toyed with his beard. About a year ago, gentlemen, there was an alien ship around here then, wasn't there? And you destroyed it, didn't you? Yes, sir, when we located it, sir. You'll destroy this one, too, Extroni said. We have a tight patrol, sir. It can't slip through, but it might try a long-range bombardment, sir. Extroni said, To begin with, they probably don't even know I'm here and they probably couldn't hit this area if they did know, and you can't afford to let them get a shot at me anyway. That's why we'd like you to return to an inner planet, sir. Extroni plucked at his right earlobe, half closing his eyes. You'll lose a fleet before you'll dare let anything happen to me, gentlemen. I'm quite safe here, I think. The bearer brought Extroni his drink. Get off, Extroni said quietly to the four officers. Again they turned reluctantly. This time he did not call them back. Instead, with amusement, he watched until they disappeared into the tangle of forest. Dusk was falling. The take-off blast of the rocket illuminated the area, casting weird shadows on the gently swaying grasses. There was a hot breath of dry air, and the rocket dwindled toward the stars. Extroni stood up lazily, stretching. He tossed the empty glass away, listened for it to shatter. He reached out, parted the heavy flap to his tent. Sir, Rai said, hurrying toward him in the gathering darkness. Eh? Extroni said, turning, startled. Oh, you. Well? We located signs of the Farnby, sir, to the east. Extroni nodded. After a moment he said, You killed one, I believe, on your trip. Rye shifted. Yes, sir. Extroni held back the flap of the tent. Won't you come in? He asked without any politeness, whatever. Rye obeyed the order. The inside of the tent was luxurious. The bed was of bulky feathers, costly of transport space, the sleep curtains of silken gauze, the floor heavy portable tile blocks, not the hollow kind, were neatly and smoothly inset into the ground. Hanging from the centre, to the left of the slender hand-carved centre pole, was a chain of crystals. They tinkled lightly when Extroni dropped the flap. The light was electric from a portable dynamo. Extroni flipped it on. He crossed to the bed, sat down. You were, I believe, the first ever to kill a farm beast, he said. I... No, sir, there must have been previous hunters, sir. Extroni narrowed his eyes. I see by your eyes that you are envious. That is the word, isn't it, of my tent? Rye looked away from his face. Perhaps I am envious of your reputation as a hunter. You see, I have never killed a farn beast. In fact, I haven't seen a farn beast. Rye glanced nervously around the tent his sharp eyes avoiding Extroni's glittering ones. Few people have seen them, sir. Oh? Extroni questioned mildly. I wouldn't say that. I understand that the aliens hunt them quite extensively, on some of their planets. I meant in our system, sir. Of course you did, Extroni said, lazily tracing the crease of his sleeve with his forefinger. I imagine these are the only farm beasts in our system. 
Rye waited uneasily, not answering. Yes, Extroni said. I imagine they are. It would have been a shame if you had killed the last one, don't you think so? Rye's hands worried the sides of his outer garment. Yes, sir, it would have been. Extroni pursed his lips. It wouldn't have been very considerate of you to— but still, you gained valuable experience. I'm glad you agreed to come along as my guide. It was an honour, sir. Extroni's lip twisted in wry amusement. If I had waited until it was safe for me to hunt on an alien planet, I would not have been able to find such an illustrious guide. I'm flattered, sir. Of course, Extroni said. But you should have spoken to me about it when you discovered the farm beast in our own system. I realise that, sir. That is, I had intended at the first opportunity, sir. Of course, Extroni said dryly, like all of my subjects. He waved his hand in a broad gesture. The highest as well as the lowest slave know me and love me. I know your intentions were the best. Rye squirmed, his face pale. "'We do indeed love you, sir.' Extroni bent forward. "'Know me and love me.' "'Yes, sir, know you and love you, sir,' Rye said. "'Get out,' Extroni said. "'It's frightening,' Rye said, "'to be that close to him,' Mia nodded. The two of them, beneath the leaf-swollen branches of the gnarled tree, were seated on their sleeping bags. The moon was clear and cold and bright in a cloudless sky. A small moon, smooth-surfaced except for a central mountain ridge that bisected it into almost twin hemispheres. To think of him as flesh and blood, not like the, well, that, what we've read about. Mia glanced suspiciously around him at the shadows. You begin to understand a lot of things after seeing him. Rye picked nervously at the cover of his sleeping bag. It makes you think, Mia added. He twitched. I'm afraid. I'm afraid he'll... Listen, we'll talk. When we get back to civilization, you, me, the bearers, about him. He can't let that happen. He'll kill us first. Rye looked up at the moon, shivering. No, we have friends. We have influence. He couldn't just like that. He could say it was an accident. No, Rye said stubbornly. He can say anything, Mia insisted. He can make people believe anything. Whatever he says, there's no way to check on it. It's getting cold, Rye said. Listen, Mia pleaded. No, Rye said. Even if we tried to tell them, they wouldn't listen. Everybody would know we were lying. Everything they've come to believe would tell them we were lying. Everything they've read, every picture they've seen, they wouldn't believe us. He knows that. Listen, Mia repeated intently. This is important. Right now he couldn't afford to let us talk. Not right now, because the army is not against him. Some officers were here just before we came back. A bearer overheard them talking. They don't want to overthrow him. Rye's teeth suddenly were chattering. That's another lie, Mia continued, that he protects the people from the army. That's a lie. I don't believe they were ever plotting against him. Not even at first. I think they helped him, don't you see? Rye whined nervously. It's like this, Mia said. I see it like this. The army put him in power when the people were in rebellion against military rule. Rye swallowed. We couldn't make the people believe that. No, Mia challenged. Couldn't we? Not today. But what about tomorrow? You'll see. Because I think the army is getting ready to invade the alien system. The people won't support them, Rye answered woodenly. Think. If he tells them to, they will. They trust him. Rye looked around at the shadows. That explains a lot of things, Mia said. 
I think the army's been preparing for this for a long time. From the first, maybe. That's why Extra only cut off our trade with the aliens. Partly to keep them from learning that he was getting ready to invade them, but more to keep them from exposing him to the people. The aliens wouldn't be fooled like we were so easily. No, Rai snapped. It was to keep the natural economic balance. You know that's not right. Rai lay down on his bedroll. Don't talk about it. It's not good to talk like this. I don't even want to listen. When the invasion starts, they'll have to command all their loyalties, to keep them from revolt again. They'll be ready to believe us, then. He'll have a hard enough time without people running around trying to tell the truth. You're wrong. It's not like that. I know you're wrong. Mia smiled twistedly. How many has he already killed? How can we even guess? Rai swallowed sickly. Remember our guide? To keep a hunting territory a secret. Rai shuddered. That's different. Don't you see? This is not at all like that. With morning came bird songs, came dew, came breakfast smells. The air was sweet with cooking, and it was nostalgic, childhood-like, uncontaminated. An extrone stepped out of the tent, fully dressed, surly, letting the flap slap loudly behind him. He stretched hungrily and stared around the camp, his eyes still vacant mean with sleep. Breakfast, he shouted, and two bearers came running with a folding table and chair. Behind them a third bearer, carrying a tray of various foods, and yet behind him a fourth, with a steaming pitcher and a drinking mug. Extroni ate hugely, with none of the delicacies sometimes affected in his conversational gestures. When he had finished, he washed his mouth with water and spat on the ground. Lin, he said. His personal bearer came loping toward him. Have you read that manual I gave you? Lin nodded. Yes. Extroni pushed the table away. He smacked his lips wetly. Very ludicrous, Lin. Have you noticed that I have two businessmen for guides? It occurred to me when I got up. They would have spat on me twenty years ago, damn them. Lin waited. Now I can spit on them, which pleases me. The farm beasts are dangerous, sir, Lin said. Eh? Oh, yes, those. What did the manual say about them? I believe they're carnivorous, sir. An alien manual. That's ludicrous, too. That we have the only information on our newly discovered fauna from an alien manual. And, of course, two businessmen. They have very long, sharp fangs, and when enraged are capable of tearing a man... An alien? Extroni corrected. There's not enough difference between us to matter, sir, of tearing an alien to pieces, sir. Extroni laughed harshly. It's, sir, whenever you contradict me. Lin's face remained impassive. I guess it seems that way, sir. Damn few people would dare go as far as you do, Extroni said. But you're afraid of me, too, in your own way, aren't you? Lin shrugged. Maybe. I can see you are. Even my wives are. I wonder if anyone can know how wonderful it feels to have people all afraid of you. The farm beasts, according to the manual, we are very insistent on one subject. It's the only thing I know anything about. The farm beast, as I was saying, sir, is a particular enemy of men, or if you like, of aliens, sir. All right, Extroni said, annoyed. I'll be careful. In the distance, a farm beast coughed. Instantly alert, Extroni said, Get the bearers. Have some of them cut a path through that damn thicket, and tell those two businessmen to get the hell over here. Lin smiled, his eyes suddenly afire with the excitement of the hunt. Four hours later, they were well into the scrub forest. Extroni walked leisurely, well back of the cutters, who hacked away methodically at the vines and branches which might impede his forward progress. Their sharp, awkward knives snickered rhythmically into the rasp of the heavy breathing. Occasionally, 
Extroni halted, motioned for his water carrier, and drank deeply of the icy water to allay the heat of the forest, a heat made oppressive by the press of foliage against the outside air. Ranging out on both sides of the central body, the two businessmen fought independently against the wild growth, each scouting the flanks for farm beasts, and ahead, beyond the cutters, Lynn flitted among the tree trunks, sometimes far, sometimes near. Extroni carried the only weapon, slung easily over his shoulder, a powerful blast rifle, capable of piercing medium armour in sustained fire. To his rear, the water carrier was trailed by a man bearing a folding stool, and behind him, a man carrying the heavy, high-powered two-way communication set. Once, Extroni unslung his blast rifle and triggered a burst at a tiny arboreal mammal, which, upon the impact, shattered asunder to Extroni's satisfied chuckle in a burst of blood and fur. When the sun stood high and heat exhaustion made the near-naked bearer slump, Extroni permitted a rest. While waiting for the march to resume, he sat on the stool with his back against an ancient tree and patted, reflectively, the blast rifle lying across his legs. "'For you, sir,' the communications man said, interrupting his reverie. "'Damn!' Extroni muttered, his face twisted in anger. "'It better be important.' He took the headset and mic and nodded to the bearer. The bearer twiddled the dials. Extroni. Eh? Oh, you've got the ship. Well, why the hell bother me? All right, so they found out I was here. You got them, didn't you? Blasted them right out of space, the voice crackled excitedly. Right in the middle of a radio broadcast, sir. "'I don't want to listen to your gabbling when I'm hunting,' Extroni tore off the headset and handed it to the bearer. "'If they call back, find out what they want first. I don't want to be bothered unless it's important.' "'Yes, sir.' Extroni squinted up at the sun. His eyes crinkled under the glare, and perspiration stood in little droplets on the back of his hands. Lynn, returning to the column, threaded his way among reclining bearers. He stopped before Extroni and tossed his hair out of his eyes. "'I located a spore,' he said, suppressed eagerness in his voice. "'About a quarter ahead. It looks fresh.' Extroni's eyes lit with passion. Lynn's face was red with heat and grimy with sweat. "'There were two, I think.' Two? Extroni grinned, petting the rifle. "'You and I better go forward and look at the spore.' Lynn said, "'We ought to take protection if you're going to.' Extroni laughed. "'This is enough,' he gestured with a rifle and stood up. "'I wish you had let me bring a gun along, sir,' Lynn said. "'One is enough in my camp.' The two of them went forward, alone, into the forest. Extroni moved agilely through the tangle, following Lynn closely. When they came to the tracks, Heavily pressed into drying mud around a small watering hole, Extroni nodded his head in satisfaction. "'This way,' Lynn said, pointing, and once more the two of them started off. They went a good distance through the forest, Extroni becoming more alert with each additional foot. Finally, Lynn stopped him with a restraining hand. "'There may be quite a way ahead. Had we ought to bring up the column?' The farn beast, somewhere beyond a ragged clump of bushes, coughed. Extroni clenched the blast rifle convulsively. The farn beast coughed again, more distant this time. They're moving away, Lynn said. Damn, Extroni said. It's a good thing the wind's right, or they'd be coming back, and fast too. Eh? Extroni said. They charge on scent, sight, or sound. I understand they will track down a man for as long as a day. Wait, Extroni said, combing his beard. Wait a minute. Yes. Look, Extroni said, if that's the case, why do we bother tracking them? Why not make them come to us? They're too unpredictable. It wouldn't be safe. I'd rather have surprise on our side. You don't seem to see what I mean, Extroni said. 
We won't be there. Ah, uh, the bait. Oh, let's get back to the column. Extraordinary wants to see you, Lynn said. Rye twisted at the grass shoot, broke it off, worried and unhappy. What's he want to see me for? I don't know, Lynn said curtly. Rye got to his feet. One of his hands reached out, plucked nervously as Lynn's bare forearm. Look, he whispered, you know him. I have a little money. If you were able to... If he wants, Rye gulped, to do anything to me, I'd pay you if you could. You'd better come along, Lynn said, turning. Rye rubbed his hands along his thighs. He sighed, a tiny sound, ineffectual. He followed Lynn beyond an outcropping of shale to where Extroni was seated, petting his rifle. Extroni nodded genially. The farm beast hunter, eh? Yes, sir. Extroni drummed his fingers on the stock of the blast rifle. Tell me what they look like, he said suddenly. Well, sir, they're, uh, pretty frightening. No, sir, well, well, in a way, sir. But you weren't afraid of them, were you? Uh, no, sir, no, because... Extraordinary was smiling innocently. Good. I want you to do something for me. I, I... Rye glanced nervously at Lynn out of the tail of his eye. Lynn's face was impassive. Of course you will, Extraordinary said genially. Get me a rope, Lynn. A good, long, strong rope. What are you going to do? Rye asked, terrified. Why, I'm going to tie the rope around your waist and stake you out as bait. No! Oh, come now. When the farm beast hears you scream, you can scream, by the way, Rye swallowed. We could find a way to make you. There was perspiration trickling down Rye's forehead, a single drop creeping toward his nose. You'll be safe, Extroni said studying his face with amusement. I'll shoot the animal before it reaches you. Rye gulped for air. But, but if there should be more than one? Extraordinary shrugged. I, look, sir, listen to me. Rye's lips were bloodless and his hands were trembling. It's, it's not me you want to do this to. It's me, sir. He killed a fawn beast before I did, sir. And last night, last night he... He what? Extroni demanded, leaning forward intently. Rye breathed with a gurgling sound. He said he ought to kill you, sir. That's what he said. I heard him, sir. He said he ought to kill you. He's the one you ought to use for bait. Then if there was an accident, sir, it wouldn't matter, because he said he ought to kill you. I wouldn't. Extroni said, Which one is he? That one, right over there. The one with his back to me? Yes, sir, that's him, that's him, sir. Extroni aimed carefully and fired, full charge, then lowered the rifle and said, Here comes Lynn with a rope, I see. Rye was greenish. You, you. Extroni turned to Lynn, tie one end around his waist. Wait, Rye begged, fighting off the rope with his hands. You don't want to use me, sir, not after I told you. Please, sir, if anything could happen to me, please, sir, don't do it. Tie it, Extroni ordered. No, sir, please, oh, please don't, sir. Tie it, Extroni said inexorably. Lynn bent with a rope. His face was colourless. They were at the watering hole. Extroni, Lynn, two bearers, and Rye. Since the hole was drying... The left partially exposed bank was steep toward the muddy water. Upon it was green new grass, tender tuft, half mashed in places by heavy animal treads. It was there that they staked him out, tying the free end of the rope tightly around the base of a scaling tree. You will scream, Extroni instructed. With his rifle he pointed across the waterhole. The farm beast will come from this direction, I imagine. Rye was almost slobbering in fear. Let me hear you scream, Extroni said. Rye moaned weakly. You'll have to do better than that. Extroni inclined his head toward a bearer, 
who had used something Rye couldn't see. Rye screamed. See that you keep it up that way, Exroni said. That's the way I want you to sound. He turned toward Lynn. We can climb this tree, I think. Slowly, aided by the bearers, the two men climbed the tree, bark peeling away from under their rough boots. Rye watched them hopelessly. Once at the crotch, Extroni settled down, holding the rifle at alert. Lynn moved to the left, out on the main branch, rested in a smaller crotch. Looking down, Extroni said, Scream! Then to Lynn, You feel the excitement? It's always in the air like this at a hunt. I feel it, Lynn said. Extroni chuckled. You were with me on Maisk. Yes, that was something that time. He ran his hand along the stock of the weapon. The sun headed west, veiling itself with trees. A large insect circled Extroni's head. He slapped at it, angry. The forest was quiet, underlined by an occasional piping call, something like a whistle. Rye's screams were shrill, echoing away, shiveringly. Lynn sat quiet, hunched. Extroni's eyes narrowed, and he began to pet the gunstock with quick, jerky movements. Lynn licked his lips, keeping his eyes on Extroni's face. The sun seemed stuck in the sky, and the heat squeezed against them, sucking out their breath like a vacuum. The insect went away, still, endless, hopeless, monotonous, rye screamed. A farm beast coughed far in the matted forest. Extroni laughed nervously. He must have heard. We're lucky to rouse one so fast, Lynn said. Extroni dug his boot cleats into the tree, braced himself. I like this. There's more excitement in waiting like this than in anything I know. Lynn nodded. The waiting itself is a lot. The suspense. It's not only the killing that matters. It's not only the killing, Lynn echoed. You understand, Extroni said. How it is to wait, knowing in just a minute something is going to come out of the forest and you're going to kill it. I know, Lynn said. But it's not only the killing, it's the waiting too. The fawn beast coughed again, nearer. It's a different one, Lynn said. How do you know? Hear the lower pitch, the more of a roar. Hey, Extroni shouted, you down there, there are two coming. Now let's hear you really scream. Rye below whimpered childishly and began to retreat toward the tether tree, his eyes wide. There's a lot of satisfaction in fooling them, too, Extroni said, making them come to your bait where you can get at them. He opened his right hand. Choose your ground, set your trap, bait it. He snapped his hand into a fist, held the fist up before his eyes, imprisoning the idea. Spring the trap when the quarry is inside. Clever. That makes the waiting more interesting waiting to see if they really will come to your bait. Lynn shifted, staring toward the forest. I've always liked to hunt, Extroni said, more than anything else, I think. Lynn spat toward the ground. People should hunt because they have to, for food, for safety. No, Extroni argued. People should hunt for the love of hunting. Killing? Hunting, Extroni repeated harshly. The fawn beast coughed. Another answered. They were very near, and there was a noise of crackling underbrush. He's good bait, Extroni said. He's fat enough, and he knows how to scream good. Rye had stopped screaming. He was huddled against the tree, fearfully eyeing the forest across from the watering hole. Extroni began to tremble with excitement. Here they come. The forest sprang apart. 
extraordinarily bent forward, the gun still across his lap. The farm beast, a tiny eye red with hate, stepped out on the bank, swinging its head wildly, its nostrils flaring in anger. It coughed. Its mate appeared beside it, their tails thrashed against the scrubs behind them, rattling leaves. Shoot, Lin hissed. For God's sake, shoot! Wait, Extrani said. Let's see what they do. He had not moved the rifle. He was tense, bent forward, his eyes slitted, his breath beginning to sound like an asthmatic pump. The lead farn beast sighted Rai. It lowered its head. Look, Extrani cried excitedly. Here it comes! Rai began to scream again. Still, Extroni did not lift his blast rifle. He was laughing. Lin waited, frozen, his eyes staring at the farm beast in fascination. The farm beast plunged into the water, which was shallow, and throwing a sheet of it to either side, headed across towards Rai. Watch! Watch! Extroni cried gleefully. And then the aliens sprang their trap. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. The God on the 36th Floor by Herbert D. Castle Originally published in Amazing Stories, December 1963 Narrated by Tom Tresen Darren's Kale walked into the glittering tile, marble and metal lobby of the Chester Chemical Company building at a quarter to nine. Office hours were 9.15 to 5.15, but Darren's came early and left late every day. He unlocked the doors to the Public Relations Department, checked to see that the custodial staff hadn't left any rags or buckets around, and, in general, fulfilled the duties of floor manager. Not that Derrens had been assigned these duties. He had assumed them over the past eight years, and because Chester Chemical was as big as it was, he got away with it. Derrens had effectively hidden himself among the 9,000 Chester employees, lost himself, as so many talentless but shrewd people do, in the hive of offices that make up a giant corporation. That was why he was able to draw a salary and merely play at working. He was alone in the self-service elevator when it shot upward. He was alone when he stepped out on the thirty-sixth floor. But after unlocking the doors across the hall from the reception room, he was immediately aware that he was not alone. From down the long, pastel-green, fluorescent-lighted corridor on his left had come, and still came, the sound of a voice. A high-pitched male voice, totally unfamiliar to Darren Scale. There was no answering voice, so the man was using a phone. It could only be one of the cleaning staff, and they'd been warned by management never to use office equipment. Darren strode toward the voice, heels clicking sharply on the black squares of asphalt tile. The voice stopped. Aha! A little game of cat and mouse, was it? Derrens kept going, watching the seemingly endless line of offices on his right for one with its door open, or a light shining through the frosted glass panel. And he saw the light in the office ahead. He stopped, his long smooth face crinkling in a swift smile. He took a quick, silent step and jerked open the door. The man seated behind the desk was middle-aged, fat and solemn. He had bright blue eyes and jet-black hair. "'Good morning,' he said in his high-pitched voice. "'I missed Zadi,' he smiled. "'I'd better spell it,' he spelled it. "'Edwin Zadi, this is my first day.' So that explained it, and Derrance was ready to back out as gracefully as possible. But then he noticed how meek Zadi seemed, and decided to stay a few moments. He came forward with hand outstretched. Welcome aboard, Ed. I'm Darren Scale. Dare to you. They shook hands. 
New writer, eh? Sardin nodded and smiled. Derrens put his hands behind his back and rocked on his heels. Personnel never bothered to inform me that you were coming. I'll have to check Miss McCarthy. She might have heard and forgotten to mention it. Is she your secretary? Derrens said, not exactly, and regretted having given in to his impulse to act important. Well, work's awaiting, as they say in the Ozarks, he chuckled. Though for future reference, Ed, you needn't come in until 9.15, the hours at Chester Chemical. Yes, I know, but I am an early riser. I will be here each morning at 8.30, perhaps earlier. Derrens decided he didn't like Tsardi. There was something vaguely foreign in the way the man spoke. Not that he had an accent. It was more a matter of offbeat timing. And that name, Central European in origin, personnel was getting sloppy. I'm afraid that's not feasible, Ed. At eight, the cleaning people leave, locking the hall doors. Miss McCarty and I have keys, but we couldn't allow them out of our possessions. He'd waited three years before borrowing Miss McCarty's and having a copy made. I do have a key, the fat man beamed. That solves our little problem, doesn't it? How'd you get? He stopped short. Time to leave should never have come here in the first place. This man isn't an ordinary writer. Is there anything wrong, da? Darren smiled. Wrong? Uh, of course not. Just thought of an urgent bit of business. Again, welcome aboard, Ed. And again, thank you, da? Tsardi smiled, somewhat apologetically. And again, that question. What question? Is Miss McCarter your secretary? I answered it, Derren said, and he found it hard to smile. I said she wasn't. No, da, Tsardi said, right hand rising, index finger lifting scholastically. You said, and I quote, not exactly. That indicated semi-secretarial status. Derrens was immediately frightened. He fought it by telling himself he was jumping to conclusions. There was no reason in the world to assume that the man was a company spy, especially since Chester Chemical never had been known to employ such methods. He laughed. It was a rich, hearty, booming, self-confident laugh, developed by means of long practice with a tape recorder. Hearing it, he was able to form an answer. Actually, Ed, Miss McCarty is the floor manager. She assigns new offices, as she did this one to you, right? No, Mr. Chester said to choose any empty office that pleased me. Mr. Chester, the founder himself. Derrance opened the door and waved his arm and chuckled and nodded an exuded good will and said, See you, Ed. Da, Mr. Tzardi said, rising. He was extremely short, not more than five feet, if that. If Miss McCarty is floor manager, what are you? No title per se, Derren said, and was horrified to hear his shortness of breath, his panicked panting. He fought for control. I work with her. The arrangement is loose, informal, almost unofficial. A typical Chester Company operation. He had the door open now, and stepped through it sideways. You'll soon learn what that means, Ed. We all stay loose here. No rigid adherence to rules. No frenzied competition. No sweat. Get it? Mr. Tsardi's face looked blank. He shook his head. I'm afraid not, da. Mr. Chester said that each employee has a position, a function, a title, and performs within sharply defined areas. I am listed as public relations writer in the personnel books. You too are listed as public relations writer, $11,000 per annum. A tortured laugh was forced from Derren's kale. The man had revealed himself as a company spy. Who else had access to the personnel records? He waved his arm again, said, Simply must rush, and fled. His office was at the other end of the floor from Tsardi's. He reached it, shut the door, and slumped into his chair. He was trembling. This was the first time in almost six years that anyone had shown true knowledge of his position. The last time had been when old Halvertson, his group head, had called him in and said, Derrance, your work's falling off badly. I'll be justified in recommending you for discharge right now, but I want to give you a fighting chance. We've got the new polio vaccine pamphlet to do, and an important fact sheet for distribution to newspapers. I'll be watching you carefully. 
but he hadn't. He'd dropped dead two days later while walking to the men's room. When word came that Halvardson's group was being dissolved and his writers assigned to other groups, Derrens had decided to make his move. Besser and Trance had been assigned to Gordon. Pete Ward had come to Derrens's office and said, "'Well, I don't really need an extra man, Kale. You're supposed to be assigned to me.' Derrens had expressed delight. "'But I've got quite a bit of work to clear up before I'm free, Mr. Ward.' Ward had seemed relieved. "'Yes, well, carry on, Kale.' Derrens had carried on for three months. Then Ward had been promoted upstairs, and the man who took his place never even spoke to Derrens. Derrens carried on and on, creating the impression, which soon hardened into fact, that he was now overseeing Miss McCarty in her position as floor manager. Since he was careful to please and flatter her, and meticulous in maintaining the routine which kept him outwardly busy, he'd never again been asked to report to anyone work for anyone, account to anyone. As for his salary, it was handled by total strangers, the fiscal department on the seventeenth floor, which was as remote from the thirty-sixth floor as interior New Guinea. Now this Tsardi came along, and soon the lovely secure life would go down the drain. And what would he do then? His face went grey, and he whispered, I could go back to writing. He groaned. It was impossible. He couldn't write. He couldn't even sit for the hours necessary for writing. A deal. He had to make a deal with Sadi. Twenty a week, for as long as he was allowed to go on this way. Or thirty. Maybe even forty. Or kill the dirty little. His voice, hard and shrill, shocked him. He was standing, fists clenched, body trembling, leaning forward as if about to rush to the door and up the hall. He made himself sit down. He laughed, but it didn't come out his hearty, impressive laugh. It was a laugh he hadn't heard since college days, except in dreams, nightmares of the past, weak, frightened, ineffectual, and apologetic. There was a knock at the door. He straightened in his chair, took a deep breath, and said, come ahead. The door opened. Mr. Tsardi stood there, his round face solemn. Before you become too involved in your numerous and important duties, Der, I would like to suggest that we have lunch together. Derren blinked. Uh, yes. How about today? Today would be fine, Der. We could talk about the company in our respective positions. You could, perhaps, help me with a rather pressing problem." Derrens relaxed quite suddenly. Twelve o'clock. Come by here? Yes, sir. The door closed. Derrens lit a cigarette. He no longer trembled. In that luncheon invitation, he read a deal. At noon, Tsardi appeared in the office doorway. Derrens was dictating a memo to personnel on the company's tacit acceptance of two-hour lunch periods by all by its secretarial help. He broke off in mid-sentence and smiled at Mercy. "'We'll finish later, dear. You've typed those other memos, haven't you?' Mercy said. "'Most of them.' She rose and turned to the door, and only then saw Sadi. She said, "'Hi, Ed,' and walked by him out of the office. Sadi came inside. "'Lovely young lady.' It was remarkably mild comet compared to what most of the writers said when watching Mercy swinging along. She was nineteen, and very good to look at, especially from the rear, which was further proof, if any were needed, that Sadi was a company spy type, not likely to be swayed by emotions that moved other men. Yet he wanted something. Of that Derrance was sure. It could only be money. Yes, Derrance said, I keep her busy. Memos, memos, dozens of memos. Which was the truth, except that once Mercy brought him the memos, neatly typed, he tore them into small pieces and filed them in his waste-basket. "'Is he dependable in her work?' Sardi asked, looking as if he were thinking of other things. "'I thought you knew her. She seemed to know you, calling you by your first name.' Sardi blinked his eyes. "'I met her this morning. You know these young girls, friendly as kittens.' Derrance nodded, 
but maintained his smile. Mercy only looked like Venus. Actually, she was shy and reserved, especially with strangers. For her to say, Hi, Ed, required a minimum of several weeks' acquaintanceship. That meant she had met Sandy before he came to this floor. That meant she was, unwittingly, perhaps, an accomplice of Tsardi's, which in turn meant that the fat man had all the information he needed to get Derrance fired. But it no longer bothered Derrance. He and Tsardi were going to make a deal. He would bet his life on it. They walked into the hall. Derrance said, "'Well, Ed, it's going to be a long, interesting lunch. Shall we splurge and try Manfredo's?' They have a degree of privacy which, I'm sure, we'll both appreciate. Tsardi nodded. Whatever you say, there. I say Manfredo's, he chuckled. Might as well make the best of it. So his comfortable life was going to suffer changes. So the brandy wouldn't be the best, and he'd buy his suits on sale, and he'd lunch three or four times a week in the company cafeteria. It might even mean giving up his beloved Sutton Place apartment— but he'd still be better off than he had to hunt for a new job, and actually work. They started with vodka Gibsons. Derren gulped his, and was ready for another. Tsadi, however, merely sipped once, and then read the menu. Derren decided he couldn't relax too much. There was going to be some hard bargaining. Tsadi said, "'It's very nice here, but rather expensive.' I would like to be able to afford Manfredo's, but I doubt. What do you earn? Derrance asked bluntly. Tsadi looked at him. Twenty thousand? Derrance was startled. Really? That's very high for a PR writer, or even a company investigator. Tsadi smiled. You know what they say? No matter what you earn, you always need more? And you need more? Yes. I have hidden expenses. Like what? Again Tsardi smiled. Now, dear, you wouldn't believe me if I told you. Try me. Mental improvement. It costs me ten thousand a year and up to maintain the rate of growth I desire. You mean college courses and books and such things cost you ten thousand a year? I said you wouldn't believe me. So you did, Derrance muttered. Shall we order? Derrance decided the time had come. "'How much?' he asked quietly. Tsadi was looking around the room. He turned to Derrance. "'I beg your pardon?' "'How much do you want?' Tsadi stared at him. Then his head jerked slightly, and he smiled and said, "'Ah, yes, how much? For my silence. I see. That would be the way, wouldn't it?' Derrance didn't understand the man's reaction. It was almost as if money had never entered Sardi's head before this moment. But if it hadn't been money— Sardi said, "'How much would you consider equitable?' "'You make almost twice as much as I do,' Derren said, some bitterness investing his voice. Twenty a week should be enough to give you a few extra sessions in mental improvement.' "'Agreed,' Sardi said. Derren covered his surprise and his discomfort. This wasn't a man adept in the shakedown, the way a company spy would be. This was a man pleasantly surprised by a windfall. For that, Derren said, I expect absolute silence. You understand me, don't you? Yes, I do. You can count on me, dear. Good, Derren muttered, fighting the awful feeling that he'd thrown away a hefty slice of income for nothing. Yet Tsardi had information which could hurt him. Tsardi had known Mercy before today and lied about it. Tsardi had said he needed help with a personal problem. They ordered. Tsardi ate lightly for a fat man. He left more than half his meal. As soon as he pushed away his plate, he said, "'I wonder if you'd be kind enough to help me in another way, dear?' Derren stopped chewing, then swallowed and took a sip of water. Another way, he said flatly. So money hadn't been Tsardi's object. Yes, I— uh. For the first time, Tsardi showed uncertainty, 
even embarrassment. "'Just as you're in trouble because of what I know, "'I'm in trouble because of what someone else knows. "'And actually, this someone else knows that I know about you.' "'You mean you have to pay off? "'No, she won't accept a bribe. "'Not money, not position, not anything. "'She wants me to turn you in.' Darren stared at Sardi. "'Then what can I possibly do?' Sardi dropped his eyes. "'Do away with her,' he whispered. They sat quietly for a good five minutes, Sardi looking at the table, Darren staring at Sardi. Then Darren said, "'What does she know about you, Sardi? "'I mean, what's the real reason you want her killed? "'You'll never make me believe it's just that she knows you know about me.' You'd simply turn me in, and the problem would be solved. Tsardi looked up. I've told you the truth. I don't want to turn you in. She insists that I do. She's given me until next Monday. That's seven days counting today. I have an office on the forty-first floor. I moved down to thirty-six to meet you, personally, to decide whether I could turn you in, and I can't. Derrance laughed. Sardi nodded. I know it sounds ridiculous, but you represent something to me, something unique and important, and— He stopped. He said, We'll forget the twenty a week, though I desperately need extra money. If you will do away with Mercy Adrian's— Mercy? My secretary? She insists that you turn me in. Yes. Do away with her, and you can continue with your job, your life— as if nothing had happened. Let her live, he shrugged. Again Derrance laughed. You assume my job means enough for me, so that I would kill for it? I hope so, Tsardi whispered. I fervently hope so. Well, it doesn't, Derrance snapped, and looked around for the waiter. Tsardi sighed. Then there's nothing more to be said. I will give you as long as possible, until next Monday— "'Then I shall inform the proper people.' "'Big deal,' Darren said, his heart sinking, his stomach twisting. "'Better out of work than in the electric chair.' "'Oh, but I can assure you of successfully escaping detection.' <laughs> "'You can,' Deterren said, smiling thinly. He caught the waiter's eye. "'And how can you do that?' "'I—I I can't tell you.' "'I thought so.' Why don't you do the job yourself, if you're so sure of getting away with it? I'm incapable of such things, just not built for ending life. The waiter came. Derrance asked for the bill. The waiter glanced at the plates half full of food, and asked if anything was wrong. Derrance said no, they were merely in a hurry. The waiter said, But, sir, the management would be willing to give you credit for a meal if— Indeed, the food were not absolutely. Tsardi said, Will you stop this theatrical nonsense? Don't you know there's no audience left to appreciate it? The waiter looked at him. Truly, sir? Tsardi hesitated, then said, Except for one, just one. And does it make sense to expect that one to come in this place of all the places in the world? The waiter's face was grim. I... I find it a very painful concept, sir. I know it was bound to happen, that it was a logical goal, and still— Yes, Sardi said. Now please give us the bill. The waiter wrote quickly, and tore the sheet from his pad. He said, That one, sir. Is he protected? No, Sardi said. The majority say he must go. Well, they surely know what is best, but I— he sighed and walked away. "'I, too,' Tsardi murmured. "'I, too.' "'What was that all about?' Derrance asked. He was preoccupied with his own problem, but had heard enough to be puzzled. "'You two sounded like a bad mystery movie, members of the underground meeting in enemy territory.' "'Something like that,' Tsardi said. "'One what?' Derrance asked. "'You said there was only one.' And what did he have to do with a waiter offering us credit on an unfinished meal, and why? 
"'We are members of a rather strange religious order,' Sardis said, looking at Derrens with unblinking intensity. "'The objects of our worship are just about extinct, except for one. "'I recognise this waiter as practising a certain ritual. "'Well, suffice it to say, I told him we have run out of gods.' "'Except for one?' "'Yes, one. Just one. And soon that one.' "'One what? Is it an animal?' "'Yes, an animal.' "'How could he expect an animal to come to a restaurant?' "'As man is an animal.' "'Then it's a man?' "'Yes, a man.' "'To hell with this!' Darren said, getting to his feet. "'You're playing with me. I don't know why, but you're—' Sardi was also standing. "'Please do not shout, Dar. his eyes darted around the room. "'No one here is shouting. You will be noted.' "'Noted?' Darren snorted. "'Why the hell don't you learn to speak English? "'You may have me in the palm of your hand, "'but you don't speak well enough to be a clerk junior grade. "'You are right. "'It is one of the reasons I need mental improvement.' "'Derrens reached for his wallet. "'Sardi said, "'Allow me, dear, please. "'I feel I've upset you and caused you to have a bad lunch.' "'Derrens had to laugh at that. "'He was confused, "'and through the confusion a strange new fear was growing.' but still he had to laugh. To put it mildly, he said, and walked away. He returned to the office without waiting for Tsardi. Mercy was at her desk typing one of his memos. She glanced up and smiled. Nice lunch, Mr. Kale? He stopped. He looked at her. Looked hard. Yes. She met his gaze, eyes puzzled. What in the world could she have on Tsardi to make him want her dead? An interesting lunch, too, Mercy. I ate with your old friend, Edwin Tsardi. She dropped her eyes. My old friend? I met him today, as you did, Mr. Kale. Did he? Did he say different? Yes, he said different. Her head stayed down. What? What did he say? He said you were his enemy, and my enemy. And he knew this was wrong. He was warning her, bringing the moment of his dismissal closer by seven days. And then he understood why he was doing this. He didn't want seven days in which to consider killing Mercy Adrian's. He was afraid of all that time. He was afraid he would learn that his job meant more to him than a young girl's life. He said you wanted me turned in. He said that if he didn't turn me in, you would. Her head came up, slowly, until she was looking at a typewriter. She began to type. He said, stop that and answer me. She continued typing. Mr. Sardi came up behind them and passed them. He said, hello, Mercy, duh. Neither answered him. He stopped and looked at them. Mercy kept typing. He said, "'I see you've made a serious error, dear. "'He said it softly, sadly. "'He continued on up the hall. "'Derrens watched him. "'Sardi said hello to everyone he passed. "'He called them by name. "'They called him by name. "'He knew everyone, and everyone knew him. "'The confusion was stronger, "'and so was a strange new fear. "'Everyone was a spy.' Everyone on the thirty-sixth floor was in with Tsardi, and yet Tsardi wanted him to stay on. It was Mercy and the others who wanted him fired, yet how could everyone else? He trembled. He backed from Mercy, staring at her. She kept typing. He turned and entered his office. He closed the door and wished he could lock it. He heard himself saying, "'Dear God! Dear God! "'Dear God!' he sat behind his desk. Then he got up and went to the window. He looked down to the busy street far below, cars and people, millions of them, life going on normally, as it always had. Why then this feeling of being alone? Why then this growing horror of total isolation? "'Except for one,' Tsardi had said to the waiter, and the waiter's face had grown sad, and he had moved away. 
as sad as Sardi's face when he'd looked at Derrens in the hall a few minutes ago. And the one was an animal, and man was an animal, and he was a man. He shook his head and put his trembling hands together and said, "'What is this? You're going to lose your job, granted. Is that any reason to lose your mind, too? Tzardia and that waiter are religious nuts. They have a symbolism and language all their own. Besides—' Here he laughed, because the fear was coming out into the open, and as soon as it did it was revealed as ridiculous. "'Besides, how can you be the last man on earth if Tzardia and all the others are here?' right here in Chester Chemical, and the waiter, and all the millions down there in the streets, and the other millions in the other cities and countries of the world. He sat down. He used his handkerchief to wipe sweat from his face and neck. He laughed, and it was almost his booming, confident laugh. He lit a cigarette and inhaled deeply, and then he began to tremble again. Against all logic, all reasoning, the horror of being totally alone in the world returned. He got up and went to the door. He put his hand on the knob. No, he couldn't open it. He laughed. It was a cracked and shattered sound. He said, Listen, out there are the typists and writers and executives. Just listen to them. Just listen to the noise. His voice slid upward in a strangled scream. He heard no noise. He looked at his watch. Two twenty. There had to be noise. He put his ear to the door. Nothing. Not a sound of any sort. He backed from the door, both hands over his mouth. He bumped into his desk. His phone rang. He listened to it. It rang and rang. The only sound on the thirty-sixth floor. Finally he turned and picked it up. He heard Sardi's voice. "'Duh, could you come to my office for a moment?' He said, "'What's happening?' He heard himself sobbing and didn't care. He said, "'Am I losing my mind? What's happening?' "'No, Duh, you are not losing your mind.' Sardi's voice sounded as if he too were weeping. "'It's just what I tried to tell you before.' "'Yes, before. Listen, I've changed my mind. If it's the only way—' "'Listen, Ed, I'll, I'll do—I'll do, I'll do what, what you said. "'You know, Mercy, I'll—' "'Too late,' Sardi murmured. "'Please come to my office, da.' "'No!' "'You must be dismissed, da.' "'Dismissed,' Darren said. "'I must be dismissed,' he quieted. "'That's all that's going to happen, isn't it? "'I mean, I'm going to be fired. "'Then you'll come to my office, da?' Derrens took a deep breath. Yes. The line clicked and went dead. Derrens put the phone down carefully. He rubbed at his eyes, then wiped them with a handkerchief. I'm going to be dismissed. It was a promise, a hope, now that the horror of something else, something insane and impossible, something infinitely worse, filled his brain and chest and stomach. I'm going to be dismissed. He went to the door. He didn't stop to listen, just opened it. He stepped outside. Mercy was at her desk, sitting quietly. She looked at him. It's all right, Mercy, I know. You were doing a job. It's all right. His voice rang in the silence of the thirty-sixth floor. Mercy didn't answer. Mercy just looked at him. He turned from her and walked up the hall. He passed Miss McCarty's office. He stopped, moved back, stood in her doorway. He would apologise for deceiving her. She sat at her desk, looking at him. He said, "'In a short while you'll learn I abused—' His voice was a squeak in an empty cavern, a footfall on a dead planet." and Miss McCarty just looked at him, unblinking, unmoving. He hurried up the hall, passing secretaries, writers, executives. All sat at their desks, quietly, unblinking, unmoving. All looked at him. He put his head down. 
He ran and held back the screams rising in his throat. Tsardi would explain everything. Tsardi would laugh at his insane fears. Tsardi would fire him, and then he would ride down in the elevator and go home and have a drink. He reached Tsardi's office. The door was open, and Tsardi sat behind his desk, unblinking, unmoving. Behind him stood three men, taller, better-built men than Tsardi. The middle one was looking out the window, his back to Derrance. The man to the right of Tsardi said, "'Come in, please.' He had a long, lean face. It looked sad. Derrance moved forward, slowly, until he was right up against the desk. He looked down at Tsardi. "'What's it all about, Ed?' Tsardi said nothing. "'What did you try to do for me?' The man to the right of Tsardi said, "'He tried to save your life. He'll be dismantled for that. It's a sad thing, of course, him being one of the original hundred, but most have been dismantled anyway.' "'Dismantled!' Deron said. The fear was immense now. "'You mean you don't know? You didn't guess anything? And Tsardi didn't tell you?' Derrance raised his eyes from Tsardi. Dismantled? Yes, taken apart, destroyed, killed. He lasted longer than most of the original hundred by each year. You understand? He was one of the first hundred made by the original himself. That's why he had defects, stilted speech, squat construction, and most serious, a tendency to romanticize humanity. Even among the latest models, there are a few who feel that way, but once the last human is gone, that problem. Derrance was calm now, the calmness beyond shock, beyond horror. I'm the last human? So we believe. There might be another in India. We're still checking. One more in Sweden is a possibility. But for the records, Derrance Kale was the last human being was the last human being, Derrance whispered. The man to the left of Tsardi began to raise his right arm. The man to the right of Tsardi said, Not yet. Then, more sharply, to Derrance, We were kinder in a war than you and your people ever were. We created no bloodbaths, no gas chambers, no panic. Over a period of twenty-seven years, we eliminated and replaced Families lived with our replacements, never suspecting the loved one was an android. We caused almost no pain at all, as you'll soon find out. Android, Derrance whispered. Machine. The voice grew curt. Anything else you'd like to know? Derrance wanted to ask why Tsardi and the others were so quiet now, and why children still ran around the streets of residential neighbourhoods, and, above all, what was the sense in a world of machines? But he asked no questions. These were not people. In man's image, but not man. Their answers weren't for him. I don't believe you, he said, wanting to hurt them, anger them, wanting most of all to hear himself say it. I believe it's all a joke, or nightmare, or figment of my insane mind. The man to Tsardi's right held up his hand. A small opening appeared in the palm and grew larger. When it was a hole as large as the wrist behind it, the man said, Breathe deeply and you won't suffer. Wait, the man to Tsardi's right said. He's the last. Let him believe. He tapped the man between, the one looking out the window with his back to Derrance. That man turned and cleared his throat, and seemed embarrassed. Derrance heard himself laughing. It was too much. He looked at the man, and laughed, and laughed. His duplicate, his android self, also laughed. It was the laugh of the true Derrance Kale, weak, frightened, ineffectual, and apologetic. "'I'm sorry, sir,' the android Derrance Kell said. I hope I can do as well as you've done. 
the hand with a hole came across the desk, and something very sweet filled the air. Darren's kale breathed deeply. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And don't forget to check out the channel. There's hundreds of stories. Hundreds of stories.